don't worry, you're not crazy. I'm really using the opening of Star Wars with the theme of 2001 A Space Odyssey just because I don't want to get any trouble with John Williams. Welcome, everyone. I know that you are coming from very far, far, far from outer space, and you find here to find a so you, you came here to find a solution about a really annoying problem we have in software development. Let me sum up what this problem is. Usually, in a software architecture, we put our backends in our backends the business logic, we don't, because we don't want that business logic to be duplicated in all the possible consumers we may have, such as web app application, mobile application, backends calling our backends. Here I have represented uh, a domain around trend reservation. You have several features, such as performing a search for train, selecting a train with search, etc. And because we don't put our users in front of our backend, since they don't know how to speak JSON, right? We also develop frontends in which you will find those features. But those things are, each, are on each side of the network. And to make sure they can communicate with each other, in between you put something which is called REST. And REST has only four words of vocabulary, which are create, read, update, delete. So it means that usually the feature you are using the, nat the English natural language to express all the subtlety of the business domain. Maybe you are using clean code to have uh, good uh, function names uh, and so on. But when you have to go on the network, you have to do a weird mapping in a way that a kindergartner child can understand. Because, for example, perform a search uh, for trains going to the destination to the user of the user, it will become something like create a search resource. And on the other side, on the back end, when you receive, when you receive sorry, create a search resource from the, the controller, you will have to translate it back to the business intent. Another example, selecting train is fair. This time, let's say that we map it on update the sub-resource selection inside the search. So we can, and this is totally arbitrary because I could have created a selection resource directly, right? So we could ask ourselves if we are not a bit mad because the user wants to search for a train going to his destination. He never asks you to create a search resource, right? But your backend, which is responsible for the business logic, this is exactly what it exposes. This is as an API, create a search resource. And I'm pretty sure that if you take a look at those sentences, you can see that even though they are equivalent regarding REST, they don't have exactly the same meaning. Here, in create a search resource, you don't have any notion of trains or destination and so on. And I'm also pretty sure that when you have user stories to develop, you really like them to look like the first sentence and not the second one, right? And unfortunately, if you have user stories with, uh, such as create a search resource, I have a, a very good advice for you fire your product owner. But why are we doing that? Why uh, do we lose some meaning here in our API? This is because of the uniform interface of REST. So I will explain what is it. This is one of the pillars of REST. Before 2000, when you had to communicate with the backend of the network, the only thing you had was the HTTP protocol. And the way to use it was really specific to that backend, so it was a bit of a mess. Then, after 2000, REST came and said, OK, we'll standardize a bit the thing, and we'll say that on each backend, now we have resources, we will enter the life cycle of those resources with the CRUD paradigm that will be mapped on HTTP methods. So, to create a resource, a post, to read a resource, a gate, update, put or patch, and delete is delete. So you have it. And maybe you know that, but REST was formalized in a PhD thesis. This is Roy Fielding that wrote something about REST. And in his paper, he warned us about something uh, regarding the uniform interface. He said that through the information, since the information is transferred in a standardized form rather than one which is specific to the application needs, we will degrade the efficiency of the system. So here, he warned us about the fact that we lose that meaning in our API, in a way. So if you want to have something which is a bit more uh, 
illustrated. Let's say that here the black hole in the back is the uniform interface of REST. In the front, the, the astronaut is your business intent of your backend. It just got engulfed in your REST API, and as a result, we all create CRUD-based APIs. I need to introduce myself. My name is Julien Topsy. I'm a technical coach at Shadow. And at Shadow, we created one startup which helped people to travel from the Earth to the Moon. So, in fact, that startup does not exist. But this is the little back end and front end I've developed for you today to give you an example of the technique that will help you to bring back the business intent inside your REST APIs. So you will see it really looks like what you know already about trend reservation, because I used to work at Expedia, by the way. And here, this is a search form. You can choose between doing a one-way or round trip. Okay? And here, you have to define your departure spaceport. So let's say we are, go we, are, we are going to GFK for that space center. And then I want to arrive on Mare Cognitum on the moon. When you hit search, you will see the outbound space train, the one going to the moon. And for each of them, you have some fares here that you can select. OK, so let's say I want to travel in the first class fare. By doing that, it has populated on the right my selection panel. And you can also see that the booking button here is not clickable yet, because my selection is not yet complete. I asked for a round trip, right? So I have to select an inbound train. Fortunately. The rest of the app has changed. Here I have all the compatible inbound trains that are according to what I have selected already. This is why here I have only two of them. So let's say that here I want the second class fare. And now I'm able to book since the selection is complete. And my, my trip is ready. You can also notice there that with Columbia Express, you are able to do a round trip to the moon for only 500 euros. So let's say it won't become a unicorn. Um, but here, so this little program here uh, will be a demonstration on how you can bring back the business intent in your REST APIs. But it has also a really nice side effect, which is purely technical. And now I will do a little demonstration that may be the best demonstration you will ever see with REST. And now I have some pressure. OK. OK, so <laughs> let's go to that page here. Uh, I will uh, try to retrieve the outbound space train, and we will see what is happening here on the network. OK, so let's refresh the page. And here I should have the request to retrieve my outbound space train. Is that big enough? Yes? Yeah? OK. So let's see how this request is made. So it's a GET request. OK. Um, it starts with a searches in the URL, because this is the name of the main object, the collection of my main object, the searches, the ID of the search. And then, because my front end wants to retrieve the space train, you had the sub-collection space train in the path. And because you only want to see the outbound space train, there is here a request parameter named bound equal outbound. OK, so is that natural for you? Are you building your APIs like that? Yeah, oh, some of them are not doing that. OK, but never mind. For the rest of the demonstration, we'll go to Postman, because it will be easier to show you what is happening. So here, this is the request. I want, I will make it a bit bigger. Is that big enough? Yeah? OK, so here, this is exactly the same request, right? And you see that this is working since I'm able to retrieve the outbound space train. So let's imagine now that my product owner said to me, Julian, we will open the Mars market. And by doing that, we will uh, offer a new feature to our users, and they will be able to do multi-destination trip. So they, it means that they can go from the Earth to the Moon, then to Mars, and be, be able to be back to Earth. So in this kind of trip, outbound and inbound doesn't mean anything. We rather like to talk about the first journey, the second one, until the last one, right? OK. So I have to do that modification in my backend here. OK, this is a Spring Boot backend uh, in Kotlin, but 
not really important that this is Kotlin, actually. This is the controller that helped me to retrieve the space train. And as you can see here, this is the request param bound, okay, which is an enumeration. Okay, quite trivial. So since I have to do that modification, and we say that, okay, we no longer talk about bound, now this is a join index, I have to do such things, right? I will change it for an integer. And because I won't develop the wall feature in front of you, internally, I will just switch it back to a bound. Okay, so val bound equal bound, oh, sorry, bound. And I think there is something here, yes, from journey index. So when journey index equals zero, it will be outbound. When this is one, it will be inbound internally, just for backward compatibility for the, with the rest of the backend. I have also one little change to do here. Okay, so can you tell me what is the impact of the modification I've just made? I will just restart the backend as well. What is the impact of that modification? Sorry? Yeah, but with, with who? Yes, with the customers, the consumers, sorry. So I have broken my API, in fact, right? So we can check that easily. I'm going here in Postman, so this one should work. This one shouldn't. And as you can see, now I have a bad request, and the backend says, hey, I was expecting for June index, but you didn't provide any. So what you just have learned here is that if you change your request params, you are breaking your API and your consumers. That's a great demonstration, right? But you knew that already. Oh, <laughs> thanks. That's not the biggest part of that demonstration, in fact. Let me show you the front end here. So it has been developed with React, JavaScript, and currently is running in an NPM process here. I think you quite agree I didn't touch anything regarding the front end. So let's see what is the impact of that modification on my front end here. Okay, so I go in there. I would say that I put some criteria. And now, when I hit search, the front end should look for the outbound space train from the back end. Who'd think that it won't work? OK, some of the people. OK. But why the other people think that it will work? I don't understand. This is working. How magic this is. So let's see what is happening on the network here. I will refresh the page, and you will see that it's there. My front end was smart enough to detect the change and without having to change the code of the front end. So here you see there's join index equals zero instead of bound equal outbound. And that's a better demonstration, right? Yeah? <laughs> you want to know how it works? Yes. So this is thanks to uh, that technique that will help you to bring back the business intent inside your API. You have to know that, in fact, we already have everything in REST to do such things. But it exists four problems that are preventing us from doing so. And we have to go through those four problems to see wha what is that magic trick, in fact. OK, so the first problem is we have false beliefs regarding REST. Let me explain you why. Let's say that here I have one feature which helps the user to book what he has selected. So it will create a new booking. If you have to map that in REST with an HTTP method and a URL, what will you use? Come on. You never uh, did any REST API. <laughs> what will be the, the HTTP method? Post, because I'm creating a resource and the URL. I heard bookings, so yeah, usually people do that. OK, fine. No, you seem surprised? No? OK. But let's say that now, here, I have another feature, rebooking. What does it mean? This is the ability for a user to rebook the same booking, the same train, at another date. Because, for example, he's a frequent traveler. He knows that this, the train is departing every Friday on, at noon. So he doesn't want to put all the search criteria. He said that I want the same train, but just another to another date, okay? So I'm creating a booking from an existing one. 
I don't do any update on the existing booking. I'm creating a new one, OK? So what will be the HTTP method post? And what will be the URL? Bookings, I heard, as well. Yeah, because in both cases, you are creating booking resource, right? And maybe here, you can see, and, or see the smell. Because on the same endpoint, I have two use cases. In the first one, which is booking from the selection, you can see here we have bookings with, as in the side of body, search ID. And we have here a loss of notion of selection. Why? Because the selection is a sub-resource of the search. This is a single resource, so there is no selection ID. The search ID is enough. So here, it means that when I take a look at it, I see post-booking search ID, OK. That's not pretty straightforward. And the intent was, I book what I have selected, but there is no notion of selection, like I said. In the second use case, we have a semantic confusion with the previous one, because this one means I want to rebook what I have already selected. But that's pretty complicated to see, right? Because they are both on post-bookings. So what are people are doing in that case? They will change the second one for something like post-rebookings. OK, that can work. But unfortunately, not in my case. But why? Because in my case, rebooking, if you hear the domain expert, is an action and not an entity. What does it mean? In fact, you have two ways to create booking. From the search, the selection you've made in the search, and an existing booking. But once created, it's exactly the same thing, with the same life cycle. And we don't care about if it has been created from an, an existing booking or not. So if you say that we have bookings and rebookings, sounds like they are different, right? And the only reason why you have done that was because of REST. But REST must not lead the design of your business domain. Because if you would have, would have used something else like a message broker, you wouldn't have that problem, right? And furthermore, this is really dangerous because this is pseudo-functional. If people, if newcomers, hear you about talking about bookings, rebookings, sounds like they are different. And maybe you will also confuse the functional people as well. So you should not do that. So how do you fix that? I think that we, sh we must align with what the user is doing. The user it's, is on his own booking. He wants to rebook the existing one, bookings ID. And here I'm adding what we call in REST a classifier, rebook. And I'm pretty sure here that in less than a second, you you all know what is the intent of that API. That was not the case when I had post bookings only. And I still have to comply with the uniform interface of REST, otherwise I won't be REST. And here, this is a post, because I'm creating a new booking from that URL, right? And once we have done that, we can retrieve the booking in the same way that any other booking we get bookings and this new ID. But maybe this solution is annoying some of you, because you heard that we cannot use verbs in REST. Who ever heard that? Yes, many of you. And you know what? This is a false debate. <laughs> and I will explain you why. Uh, maybe you know all that nomenclature of REST that says, OK, you start with the collection of your main object, with the object with the S, then you happen the ID if you want one element, then sub-collection, and so on. But this nomenclature is just a help. It was not, it, it was not, it, this is not a standard. It, it, this is not even in the, uh, the Royal Fielding thesis. And it goes even further because in his thesis, Royal Fielding used opaque, API, uh, opaque uh, URLs. But why? It's weird. Because there is something fundamental with the URL in REST. But maybe you don't have it. He says that at no time, the server and the client need to know or understand the meaning of the URL. What? But I'm pretty sure that we are all coding li that like that. I mean, when you, you are on the client part, the front end on something else, you say, OK, front end, if you need to retrieve a particular search, you do searches slash, and you up expand here the ID. If you need inside it the space train, OK, concatenate space train. Who is coding like that? No one. You are liars. I was coding like that as well. OK. And say that 
We should not do that. And you know why? Because if the front end doesn't know how to build the URLs, the back end can change the URLs without impacting the consumers. That makes sense. And you know why? Because the consumers won't be able to call the back end, since they don't know how to call the back end, right? But no, in fact, there is a mean. This is one of the secrets of the magic trick. In fact, the front end will be able to know what will be the URL to call without knowing how to build them. But we'll see that at the very end of the talk. Because before seeing how it works, we need to go through another problem. So usually we are confusing the model and the business. Sounds complicated, but you will see this is pretty easy to understand. The business is what the user is doing. So she is actually trying to select a train user fare. Okay, so among this list of the outbound space train, she will click on the fare of the space train she wants. This is the business, okay? The feature. The model is what you have done to solve the problem in your code. So for example, here, this is my search class. This is one way to solve that problem. What I have inside the search class? I have available space trains with inbound and outbound ones, and also there's here selection that will contain in selected space train the ID of the spec train the user has selected. But I could have done something else, right? I could have removed the selection here and put booleans in the available space train, which, uh, which one is selected. That will work as well. This is another way to implement that feature. And the problem is there, in fact. Because usually, when we think about a REST API, the only thing we do is that we align with the implementation. So it means that if we want to update, uh, sorry, to select a train with a fare, what we'll do is that, okay, so this is inside the selection inside the search, so we do patch of the sub-resource uh, sub selection inside the search. So we see the modification there. Okay. But if I change the code, what happened? If I move to Booleans in the available space train, what happened? So you see, because of that, your consumers will be um, coupled with your implementation. And like I said, at no time they ask you to update the sub-resource selection inside the search. They want to select a fare on a train. And if you do such kind of APIs, the CRUD-based APIs in REST, when you have very complicated domains, you may end up with a really complicated user experience. Imagine that uh, you are trying to travel with train, and here what you see is just update selection resource. Okay, click on that. Oh, I have to do weird thing, cred based. But don't worry, it doesn't happen much, because usually this is what we have. Uh, nice front end and ugly back end. Why? Because the front end still have to comply with the, the, the business intent, right? Because he's end user facing. But your ugly back end is cred based. So it means that the front end, all your consumers, have to translate the business intent into the cred based API. The, this is what I call the accidental complexity of adaptation because all the consumers will have to do that. And this is because we are exposing our model to our consumers, so our implementation to our consumers, instead of the behaviors. So how to fix that? OK, we can simply encapsulate that translation inside the backend. And yeah, that would work, right? But there is a problem with encapsulation and REST. I really like that meme, because here on top, this is a task manager of Windows, and it helps you to kill one not responding process it is, and the tax manager himself is not responding, and uh, Obi-Wan said you were supposed to get and not to join them. So this is uh, from where, what he said to Anakin. But anyway, do you know what is encapsulation? Who doesn't know what is encapsulation? Okay, some of you. So I will quickly explain what is it. Here I have a search class with attributes, ID, criteria, space train selection, and only getter status. It means that, for example, I have done a search from Paris to Brussels. So in my criteria, it says that I want to go from Paris to Brussels, and my trains goes from Paris to Brussels. Fine. But if I do set criteria here, and I change the destination to London, I will put the search object in an inconsistent state, since the criteria says it goes to London, but the space train still goes to Brussels. 
So this is what Martin Fowler calls an anemic domain because here you expose your state to the others. And all the services inside your application will have to, dig to deal with the business logic. Because what should you do when you change the destination? You should also reset the space train. So all the consumers of the search of that will have to do that. It also means that since the search will be in a consistent state, you will have to do defensive code to make sure, OK, is it in the state that I can use that object? So usually, in object-oriented paradigm, we say that we must encapsulate the state to expose behaviors instead. Those behaviors are function. So here, for example, change criteria. So I no longer have any setters. And this set criteria will reset here as well the, the space train internally. So it will deal with the state transition of all the attributes in a co consistent way. Why am I t talking about that? Because, so first, I would like to know who are coding like this. Yeah, some of you. But maybe you know that the problem after that is when you want to expose this in, expose, yes, to expose it in REST. Because in REST, you can just serialize all the fields only, right? What's about the function? What's about the services inside your, your application? You can't do anything about that. The only thing you can serialize are the fields. So it means with REST, you they encapsulate the behaviors to expose the states directly to your consumers. And thanks to the CRUD paradigm, uh, they should have something like a super uh, getter setters that can change all the fields. In fact, you won't implement the patch on all the fields, so that might not work. But theoretically, this is what happens. So here, one, once again, we can ask yourself, you are not a bit mad. Because if you think about it, in your backend, on one side you have REST. REST is CRUD-based, right? On the other side you have the database. The database is CRUD-based. You are doing SQL, no SQL, this is CRUD-based. In between, we want to put something which is not CRUD-based, the business logic. So it could be simpler if we do that business logic in a way that this is just CRUD-based and everything will be aligned. Why? Why? But if you do such thing, you can think about it. Why are we doing even backends? We can use Postgres REST and expose every table we have as an API. And no code will kill us all. But why are we don't do that? Because it's quite complicated to put complex business logic in the, the database, and it's quite complicated to test that in the database. So usually, you need that business logic inside your backend so it also means that you need to keep it inside your REST API. Who is, pro who is doing here domain-driven design? Yeah, some of you. This slide is for you. Do you know the real meaning of CRUD? Yes? I'm not sure. It's completely ridiculous and uses domain-driven design. You have pushed so many in thought inside the core of your application, but try say, eh, whatever. <laughs> but don't worry, there is a mean, in fact. But before going further, just to illustrate that the encapsulation problem, remember the, when I had two endpoints, uh, sorry, two use cases on the same endpoint, the only mean I have to make the difference and to know in which use case I, I, I am is by taking a look at the payload itself. So that's why here, there is a loss of meaning through the encapsulation. We have to read the payload to deduce the use case. OK. So let me sum up what we have seen about the problem. This is the business. The user, she's selecting a fare on her, uh, on her train. And usually, this is the API we built on the back end. OK, so what is it? The patch, searches, ID, selection, OK. And inside it, maybe you don't know that, but this is the, a JSON patch. So here, JSON patch would help me to do fine-grain operation on the path I would like to change. So here I say, I would like to add something in the subpath select expression of selection by adding the train number, blah, 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 and the fair code first. OK. So here, there are two problems. The first one is the accidental complexity of adaptation. Once again, I talked about that already. The second thing is that we have here the encapsulation. But why? Because you all had to take time to understand the content of 
uh, that request to deduce the intent of that API. Because I could have done something else. I could have selected the seat options there, saying I want to be near the ale or near the window. So how do I fix that? I, uh, I will use exactly the same thing at the beginning. I will align with what the user is doing. So what is she doing? She's currently on a search with an ID, the ID of the current search. She wants to select a space train with a number, having a fair code, which is this one, and then the classifier select. And once again, in less than a second, you all know what is the intent of that API. There is a pause there because I'm creating a selection. Okay. And here, in fact, your backend doesn't have to change. And it's not really aligned with what is exposed as an API, but it means that from the controller perspective, you will have to do that translation. And if you are doing hexagonal architecture, that's pretty straightforward because usually on that part, you have an adapter. Some people here are doing hexagonal architecture. Great. But it remains a problem. Because if you remember what I said, at no time, the front end should, should know how to beat the URL. So damn, how can he call that bloody URL if he doesn't know how to build it? Finally, we'll see how it works. So, but yeah, there's a problem before. But this is really correlated to that, is that usually when you build a REST API, this API is anemic regarding the workflow. What does it mean? So I just represented here the two workflows from my API. So uh, this is an event storming, by the way, but never mind. The second use case here is the round trip search, and this is the one we will go through through the API. So here are the list of the endpoints that you have to go through to perform a round trip booking. The first thing is to create a search by splitting criteria in the payload. Then you retrieve the outbound space train, you select one of them you retrieve the inbound space train, you select one of them, and because here your selection is complete, you create your booking. Fine. Now I have one question for you. From the API perspective, how do you know that you have to proceed in that particular order? I don't say Swagger. No one is documenting that in Swagger. How do you know? You don't. So I have another question as well. What is preventing the front end from displaying the inbound trains before the outbound ones? What is preventing him for it to train to retrieve inbound trains for a one trip search, one way search? Does it make sense? And calling the booking creation endpoint, although the selection is not yet copying, uh, completed. In fact, nothing. And you know why? Because the front end is the only one that owns the business workflow. But it's weird. Since we say that, OK, the business, the business should be on the back end, because we don't want that to be duplicated everywhere. But here we say that it doesn't hold anything about the workflow. It only exposes steps of that workflow. And all the consumers are implementing the real business value, which is the workflow itself. Right? And, and why? Because our API are anemic regarding the workflow. Another sign of that is that usually, in the front end. When you want to display the booking button, you do such things. OK, am I in a round trip search? Yes. Is the outbound selected and the inbound selected? Yes. OK, so I can display the booking button. You are doing that, right? Everyone is doing that. I was, I was used to doing that. But here you can see this is business logic, right? And if I change that logic on the back end, I will have to change it on the front end as well, introducing, for example, the multi-destination feature. So this is a clear sign that here you have a leak of business logic inside your back, uh, your front end and your consumers. How do we fix that? Uh, yeah, but you, we can just simply encapsulate the workflow inside the API. But I'm not sure this is possible. In fact, there is something. Did you heard about the recharge and maturity model of REST? I will sum it up if you don't know it. So the Richardson maturity model classifies REST into four levels. Level one, you're not REST. Uh, uh, yes, level zero, sorry. We are IT engineers, so this is zero, not one. Level zero, you're not REST. Level one, you have resources. Level two, you are using HTTP verbs to handle the life cycle of the res these resources. 
and everyone stopped there. But from the really beginning of REST, you have something else, which is called the hypermedia controls. And this is where you will find all the things you need to bring back the business intent inside your API. So what is the hypermedia control? It has also an ugly name, which is ATOS, that stands for hypermedia as the engine of the application state. But I really like the engine of application state because it sounds like a behavioral engine. And what this is? In fact, this is a leaking system that will allow you to expose the relationship between your business domain object, discover the domain, and the more important part, encapsulating the business workflow inside your API. And now I will do a little demonstration of that. OK, so let's see how it works with ATOS now. So, OK, so this is the first endpoint that need to know the front end, OK? So in fact, there is a mean to bootstrap it, but anyway, we won't see that. That's not really important. But this one helps you to create a search, OK? Here, uh, you have to say what are the criteria, OK? So the spaceport ID of the departure, the spaceport ID of the arrival, the de departure schedule. I will send that to the back end. As a result, here I have a 201 created, so I have created the resource. And usually, what people are doing is that they will serialize the full resource inside the, the payload. So remember what we have in the search? We have the ID, the selection, the space train, right? So let's see what I have selected on my, uh, serialized on my set. Here, there is the criteria, but you will, won't see anything related to space train selection and so on. Instead of that, you have links. Weird. But you can see that, we're, that each link has a name, like selection or all outbounds, with beside a URL. So it means that if you want to get the selection, you just have to take that link and request it according to the uniform interface. And now you are inside the selection. What do you see? Inside the selection, there is no space train for, for now. Makes sense. I didn't select any. And there are also some other link, like the self. Self means this is the actual resource you are on. So you can see here in the URL, this is a selection. This is, this is a convention, right? But you see also there is a, a link search, a, a search link that will help you to go back to the search. OK, so if I request it as it, I'm inside the search again. Fine. So you can see that here you can go through all the relationship of the object of your domain it will make your API more discoverable. But you can do fancier stuff. Because remember how my front end was used to retrieve the, the space train. They have to do something. OK, in that case, this is bound equal out bound. Okay, you don't have to bother with it, because there is a link, which is semantic, that says, OK, you want all the outbound space trains, call that link. OK, so I don't have to care about how the link is built. I just have to request it. So that's why that if I change that URL from the backend perspective, the front end won't be impacted because it doesn't have to read what is inside. The leak is serialized inside the payload itself. So that's the secret of the magic trick. But we can go even further because, OK, uh, so I'm inside the list of the album space train. I would like to select one of them. OK, so which fare do you want to select? This one, the first cast fare. OK, there is a link for that, select. So if you want to select that uh, fair, you have to do a post that this, this time because you still have to comply with the uniform interface, meaning here you are creating a selection. And the outbound and the fair are inside the selection. See here the total price and self point to the selection. But what is also fun here is that now we have another link, which is create booking. Because when the backend serialized that response, he detected that the selection is complete, so he provided that link. This is something we didn't have at the very beginning here, remember? Here, this is the, the state of the, the selection before having selecting anything. And see, here there is no uh, create booking at all. So it means that if I want to create a booking, OK, I just have to get to, to, to request that URL. This time, I'm creating a booking, so this is a post. And that's done. Booking is created. 
And what is really fun about that is that if you go on the if you go to the front end, the only thing the front end needs to know is is there any create booking link to display the booking button? Pretty handy. It will reduce the cognitive load of your consumers, in fact, because you provide everything in a semantic way. They don't have to care about all the business logic. What does it mean to, to be able to book? You have a link for that. You don't have to care. OK. We can go even further and do things that are even more complicated. Let's do um, a round trip this time. So it's OK, you get it? Yeah? So this time, I will do a round trip search. So I have the inbound and the outbound journey in my criteria. I will send that to the back end. And this time, you will see that here, I have a new link, all the inbounds. Yes, because that time, I can retrieve inbounds if I want. And you see here, there is June index equal 0, June index equal 1. But I, have, I don't have to care about it. This is served by the back end. So there is also something which is great here, is that since I don't have to care about how the URL is built, the back end just can just put everything it wants. I didn't explain to you why there is one only selectables to false here, for example. Once again, you don't have to care. But I will explain to you why. OK, so let's go through the all outbounds. I want to select one of them, OK? So we have seen that already, right? In the one-way oh, sorry, one -way, one -way use case. So here, I will select one outbound train. But this time, since I would like to do a round trip, I should not be to book, right? Able to, to book, right? So as you can see here, there is no trade booking. But instead of that, there is a link that invites me to select to select an inbound for the current selection. Because as I, I said at the very beginning of that talk, all the inbounds are not compatible with what I have selected. So that's why here there is the only selectable set to true, but in the all inbounds, we have only selectable set to false. And once again, as a consumer, you don't have to bear with it. This is serialized by the back end. But let's imagine that okay, the, the front end wants to go through the all inbounds here. But if he does that, you agree that those inbounds may not be compatible with uh, the, the outbound I have selected, right? So to avoid any mistake, the backend will serialize in the select uh, link a reset station set to true. Once again, this is not error prone because this is the backend which is leading the workflow of the, um, the front end. He put everything he needs to remain in a consistent state. So if I try to force a selection of that incompatible inbound, as a result, so this one is a post once again, as a result, in my selection, the outbound will disappear. I still have only the inbound. And I still not have the ability to book, but instead, the, the back end um, proposed me to select an outbound for the current selection. So that's why here, only selectable is set to true. If I go through that link, now you will see that the selection link, the select link, is reset to false. All this complexity is hidden by the backend. That's nice, right? Yeah. So, <coughs> the links. As you have seen, the front end must not try to understand how the URL are formed. If you, it respects that, you will have a better decoupling between your consumption, the, the consumer consumption, and the implementation of your domain model. Because it will be coupled with the semantic, the business intent, instead of your implementation. Then you can change the URLs. It won't have any impact on the consumer. So the impenus mismatch we had regarding REST was due to the fact that we have false beliefs regarding the REST nomenclature. We thought that we could not use verbs, but in fact, verbs enrich the semantic of the API. The only thing you can't do is to use verbs which are at odds with the HTTP method, meaning get create is forbidden. Because this is confusing, right? Get is supposed to retrieve data. If you are a real that say, OK, I'm creating something, no, you shouldn't do that. This is the only thing you can't do. 
The other problem was that we had a straight exposition of our model in the API, the implementation. Instead of that, we have business-oriented endpoints on the back end, which is semantic now. We also were exposing the states of our domain object directly, you know, getter settings with CRUD and so on. Instead of that, now we are encapsulating the behaviors and we'll attach it to the responsible object in the API through the links. Remember the select link, right? It was inside the fair, inside the right space train. So this is encapsulation. And finally, we had a lack of workflow definition in the API, but thanks to that hide and seek you know, game with the links, with ATOS, you are able to drive the workflow of your uh, consumers. And with all those things, you will be able to bring back the business intent inside your API. Just as you know, um, no, not as you know, but there are some cases where it might not be a good fit. Usually, if you have a lot of information to retrieve from the, the user with a big form, OK, you still have to think about what I have to put inside the payload. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a really good thing when you have strong workflows, I mean, real, well-defined business workflows, but each time you need to retrieve something which is quite, uh, which requires a lot of data, you, you have in a way to break that identity game and the front end has to know what he has to send you, right? So that's one of the limitations. You may also think, uh, wonder if there is a limitation regarding the URLs. It has one, but I have applied this in production at Expedia. The URL was pretty long, but it had, we never reached the limit. So, but keep in mind that uh, it has one as well, uh, the URLs. OK, so that's all for me. You can scan that uh, QR code if you want to take a look at the repository. And thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, we have one minute if you, someone has a question. Yes? Yes. Okay, so the, so the question is, the, the flow is driven by the backend, but we don't really have the HTTP method to know how we can call that URLs. So there is two options. First option is that you have to comply with the uniform TFA. So each time you know that you are creating a resource through that link, this is a post, and so on and so on. But it exists something else as well. Maybe I will have time to show you that, which is called the affordances. So Spring ATOS has a really nice support of such things. And you will see that you will be able to serialize with a special accept header uh, what is needed for that uh, endpoint. And for example, here, you have um, an endpoint that helps you to manage employees, create employees, and so on. And here, it says that if you want to modify one, there is a, a put method. And also, what you can do, this is what we call HAL form for uh, easy, uh, I mean, for quite trivial situation. You can also say what kind of um, information you need. For example, here it says that it wear the ID, the first name, and so on. But by default, everything will be strings. This is a limitation. With that, you can perform some dynamic uh, you can create dynamic forms driven by the backend, but the thing is you won't know what is the type, but by default this is string. So thank you very much. If you have any question, you can come and see me after the talk. Thank you.